Okay, I was introduced. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I have my camera on you guys, so I'm able to tell if you laugh at my jokes. So make sure you laugh at my jokes. And also then I can pause and, and revel in you laughing at my amazing jokes. So yes, okay, good. I can. Uh, I now have a sense of timing. This is good. Um, so um, I did not hear myself being introduced. So hi, I'm Christy Balai. I'm assuming that I was introduced. Um, so I am a new professor at Kent State University. And so um, I'm gonna be talking to you briefly about uh, my experiences in the open science community and just trying to make science more inclusive using open technology and where we're, I think we're going wrong in order to um, help us address things in the future. Okay, so technology, will you support me? Okay, so share. And looks like I'm sh slide sharing. Okay, everyone's reacting well. Okay, so um, title of my talk is Opening the Lab Door. So. Um, I know that this is a mixed group of, um, of people from a wide variety of fields, but I'm a scientist, specifically an ecologist, and what I like to say when someone hits a challenge in science is that science is hard. Science is a really hard thing to do. Uh, we are literally trying to unlock the secrets of the universe, and so that's not a small task. So anything that we do in science is inherently difficult. And so I'd also argue that science is getting harder. Um, over time, we have um, increased our ability to collect data. Um, we have more information, more connectivity. And so, um, and we've also answered a lot of the low hanging fruit problems in science. And so science is increasingly flooded with more information, more complexity. Um, and so a lot of scientists who were sort of classically trained are sort of reeling with this um, new world of science. Science has also been shaped by the technology that we, was available to us in the past. Um, so um, I can only invoke the, um, the printing press as sort of the best example of this. The printing press came along and changed how we um, circulate scientific information um, through the preparation of manuscripts and then holding those manuscripts in libraries. But we can think of examples of this throughout the scientific enterprise. So I would argue that in my field, um, it was, the post-World War II expansion of the North American university system uh, that largely shaped the statistics that we do in um, ecology and environmental biology, because simply that's when things were expanding. And that's when our culture of how we were interpreting our statistics was formed. And so the statistics culture of the time shaped how we do our analyses. In my field, there's also something very pervasive that um, Morgan Ernest, who is at the University of Florida, describes as the cowboy myth. This is the idea that science is done by the lone genius out there communing with nature, wolves in the background, um, just feeling the environment and, then, and figuring it all out um, through sort of this lonely effort. Um, but we know now that, um, well, scientific authorship, um, a number of authors is increasing on scientific papers. And so science is not typically done by this lone genius who's out there on their own. And then we have the issue of looking the part. Now I can see into the room right now and um, I can see myself and I can tell you that I do not look very much like the person who's drawn in this picture. Now, this was drawn by a seventh grader named Nick um, before he visited Fermi Lab, which is a national lab here in the US, um, about what he thought a scientist looked like. And so people um, and the media have reinforced this stereotype of what a scientist is and what a scientist looks like. And so there's the issue of people sort of believing in themselves and believing in um, others when they're tr evaluating the strength of a scientific contribution. So um, people are more likely to be believe, essentially, uh, someone who looks very much like this man over someone who is young, a person of color, because they don't necessarily have um, the association in their mind um, that this is what a scientist looks like. And well, um, I believe that that's an absolute fallacy and that's something that we have to address. And so here we have a visual metaphor for scientific inclusivity. Um, a tower on a hill, 
one path in, not easily accessible. And so this is sort of a model how, of how science has been approached um, through most of modern history. Um, essentially, the elite find their way in, and the people who don't know where it is and don't know the path in can't get to it. So enter this idea of taking silent science out of the silo. Um, so science is also done sort of within very um, protectively within its own lab. So this is not breaking down this metaphor of, um, you know, the ivory tower. Um, we can address this, though, by taking very specific action. And so one of the things that you are all very familiar with, and you've been talking about all day, is open science and open access. This was a way of, um, we just sort of looked at this and said, this is the panacea. This is the way to address all of the issues that we have in science. We can harness the power of, uh, and the connectivity of the web to increase efficiency. We can increase sharing of our research, collaboration. Essentially, you don't have to be at a university, physically at a university to participate in science because we could build tools that bring people in. And this was really, really appealing to us nerds. Yes, that's me in a Dalek costume. <laughs> Um, so nerds are well known um, to, when they find something they like, to really, really embrace the idea. Um, they, they really throw themselves in with all of the passion in the world and they want to make it happen. And sometimes they don't understand why other people haven't quite grabbed on to their ideals. So open science is a great idea and with um, the, uh, the appeal of it, there has been a proliferation of nerds, and with the proliferation of nerds, we've had a proliferation of solutions to all of these different problems that come up in science and trying to address them. Um, and so this is something I tend to show in a class that I teach on open science, and it just immediately overwhelms people. They go, oh, wow, there is a lot of tools available, so do I learn all of them now? Um, and so in, in addition to all of these tools being available, it, it's kind of approached with this ideological purity of, um, you know, we, we now have these tools, so we should all um, be using them. But there's been a lot of pushback in the scientific community against open science. And so um, I've been sort of thinking about what is the pushback? Who are pushing? Who are the people pushing back? And I can break them into some fairly rough categories. But I'd say that the first category of people pushing back against open science are the busy. So we're all really busy as researchers. We have everything on our plate. And so um, we, when something comes along that changes, you know, our, our system for doing things, like so the most efficient system that we have for doing things, it's a learning curve and people simply don't have time to take it on. Um, and so I'd say that this is probably the largest group of people that I see push, um, pushing back against open science. It's like, that's a great tool, but when am I going to learn it? Then there's another category of people um, that I would describe as the hostile. So I feel like these are a subset of the busy that have just been pushed a little bit too hard on and where um, they are essentially pushing back in a very um, aggressive and hostile kind of way. Um, and so this is an example of a tweet um, thread from a person who had reviewed a paper and the other reviewer had um, placed some very hostile comments about the open science practices that were expected by the journal um, in the review for the paper. And so this was a person who's saying, um, uh, the, the so open science has created an atmosphere of fear to disagree, and there's the, the symbols of ethical purity to intimidate authors like infamous badges. This is someone who has uh, been exposed to open science and says, no, I had enough, and these people are obnoxious and I'm not gonna do anything with them. Um, and so I think that that's probably someone who's been busy and pushed a little bit too hard, or it's someone who has succeeded in the current paradigm and it and they're saying if i succeeded what are these um dang kids who are on my lawn saying that we need to change um, how we need to do things then there's people who have legitimate worries about open science and open data so um 
Ed Young, um, who is a science communication um, person and author, um, very um, common, very famous on Twitter, wrote a uh, article for The Atlantic earlier this year um, about the potential for open science to be used against science by um, the science hostile governments uh, of the world. So um, particularly right now, the US is not in a very science positive place. Um, and so he point, pointed out and made the argument in this paper that if we are essentially um, showing science with all the lumps, bumps and warts um, that we have, it, uh, it creates this um, doubt and it helps people who want to take down science find a wedge and get to get in and um, essentially undermine science itself as an enterprise. Um, now, I, I personally think that it's a little bit of a weak argument because if we're hiding the lumps, bumps and warts, that makes it all the worse when people find them out. But it, it does make a compelling argument. You, you, we are on the defensive right now as scientists. Then there's the issue of the unheard. Um, and so these are people who um, are interested in participating in open science and open science practices, but they feel their needs are not being met by the open science community. And so um, I'm gonna give a very specific example. Um, fairly recently, the, the open science community has been pretty aggressive about open peer review. So the idea that you sign a review and make it available when you review a paper. So um, I actually presented this as a, um, a topic for discussion in my open science class. And um, so I asked, so what, what are the favors? Are people in favor of this? Would they um, support this? Would they sign a review? And there, there was a very clear line of um, people um, between the two types of people who would say, yes, I would sign a review. And yes, uh, no, I would not sign a review. Um, so my class was graduate students at Michigan State University and almost all the white male students said, oh yes, I will sign a review. Um, you know, people will have to learn to accept my feedback and I don't feel threatened by doing that if I'm providing honest feedback. The women and underrepresented minority people in that class said, absolutely not. I do not trust the system to pre prevent retribution if someone disagrees with something in my review. Um, and I don't blame these students. Um, there's been several high profile um, cases of sexual abuse amongst high, pro uh, like high profile scientists in the US in recent years um, who have been, uh, things have been swept under the rug. And so if we can't protect women and minorities from wanton illegal abuses by people in power, how can we protect them from sort of um, more subtle things like well, this person, um, these are two people um, who um, are applying for a job in my lab, and this person gave me an unfavorable review at one point. How do we prevent that kind of retribution um, to be um, used within the system? And then I am coining this term because um, I looked it up and it has never been used on Google before, except for when someone um, misspelled open Spain. Um, so open, the open splained. Um, so this is a really common phenomenon that occurs um, when um, people are talking about what they're doing in open science on the web. You will often, if you make any comment about what you're doing, have just a herd of people kind of jump on you and say, well, did you try this? Did you try that? Did you try this? And you, you can just say, well, I was not asking for advice, but thank you. <laughs> And so this is a really common and very alienating um, aspect of open science that we need to address because what we're doing is we are overwhelming people who are new to open science and we are um, making our community rather off-putting by um, just being a little too excited about it at times. And so here is our visual metaphor for open science inclusivity. We don't even have a path in, but at least there's an octocat on the top of the mountain. And this actually bears out. Um, so I don't have statistics for contributions within the open science community, but I do have um, statistics for um, contributions within the open source tech community. Um, so 
most uh, so there there is um, amongst programmers in the U.S. There is um, 22.9 percent, I believe the number was, um, women, uh, um, uh, women identified programmers. In the uh, open source tech community, we have about 3% of the contributions are done by women. Now, I, I wish I had um, better stats for underrepresented minorities as well, but this was a study that was done based on the names associated with the contributions. So not only are, do we have all of the biases of science creeping in to um, open science, we also have this additional filter of all the biases of tech that are being layered on top. So instead of alleviating some of the problems, we're actually exacerbating them. Um, and so I have some strategies that I think that we can adopt as a community in order to better um, address some of these uh, diversity issues and inclusivity issues. Um, so we really need to think about how we're gonna give everyone a place at the table. Um, and so as a new professor, I'm very um, focused on how do we both educate um, new people coming into the community and also improve the culture for the people who are already within the community. And so one of the ways that I find um, is the best way to get these skills on the curriculum, um, open science type skills into the curriculum and get them into the classroom is by going to university administrators and telling them about all of the hard skills I am going to teach their students. And then when I go to recruit students, I reframe them in uh, terms of soft skills. Um, so university administrators love it when you tell um, people, um, when you tell them that you are going to teach their students programming, you're going to teach their students better quantitative reproduce, um, re reproducible methods. We're going to teach them how to navigate um, scientific authorship. Um, we're going to teach them to be software developers. But when it comes to students, a lot of students don't see themselves in those identities. They, they want to do science, but they, they, they don't see themselves as software developers. They don't see themselves as quantitative people. They don't see themselves as computational people. And so that can be very alienating. And so if we reframe them in terms of the goals that the technology provides rather than learning the hard skills and the, um, and the actual nitty gritty of the, the skill, it, it seems to break down that barrier. It seems to attract a broader group of students to the class. Now, there's a lot of current efforts in this area. Um, so I personally am involved with um, data carpentry and software carpentry and um, the Mozilla Science Lab working open workshops. I've, I've taught all of those different types of workshops myself. Um, and there's a lot of, um, the, the general model that's used for those workshops is we, we do boot camp style approaches where we take people out of their, um, their normal environment and we immerse them in open science culture and skills development culture for two or three days um, where, and they learn a, a variety of skills and we um, use all the best pedagogical techniques and then they go back to their environment and the hope is that they take it with them. Um, now, I personally feel that th there is room to grow on this. Like this is a really good start, but it's, it provides a bit of a disconnect between, you know, th this is something that happens at the workshop and then learning to translate it back to your own work is the challenge. And so what I argue for is controlled immersion. So um, this is where we have to embed these skills in the very curricula that we are teaching our students within their own programs, um, where we essentially provide them with swimming lessons in open science and make it relevant to the work that they are doing. Um, so I'm gonna give you my very specific example. Um, I developed a course for teaching open science specifically to graduate students in ecology. Um, and so the idea was we have them as in a semester long class rather than sort of the two day boot camp, And we teach them all of the exact same skills that we would in a data carpentry and a software carpentry and a little bit from the working open workshop. Uh, we, we layer them all together, but over the course of a semester and we do it using an example from their field. So specifically using an example from the given field of the students. Um, and so the idea is we get them to use a real problem as well. So they get invested in it. Um, they 
are finding out new information when they apply these skills rather than working on a problem set. And it really gets them going because they are doing essentially their own work independent of their primary supervisor. And so I've built a course guide for this, if you're interested in picking it up. Um, uh, there is an instructor guide available on my um, GitHub. Um, and so it gives an outline for a 14 week um, graduate student targeted course. Um, where um, essentially they work through everything, um, starting with open data, and they move through into open analysis, reproducible analysis. Then they talk about visualization, communication, all of those topics around data, and then um, collaborative science. So we talk about uh, what we, um, within their groups, they use collaborative tools um, in order to co-write a paper. And um, they also talk about citizen science and other models for bringing people in to the scientific enterprise. So far, this has been pretty successful. So the first offering of the course, um, we um, wrote a paper and the students published it. And while it was as available as a preprint on BioArchive, it was picked up by Science Magazine. And so suddenly the administration of the university that I was working at said, oh, you've got something here. Okay, because it, it part of the problem is getting the open science um, outputs to um, be considered as successful within sort of the uh, dominant academic paradigm. If you don't have buy-in from the dominant paradigm, you're you're just not going to be able to get the things uh, to take hold within and and um, change the culture from within. And so, speaking of changing culture, okay. Visual pun here, anyone? There we go. <laughs> so we're gonna change the culture and we're going to use my patented dim sib plan of um, changing culture, D-M-S-I-B. No, it doesn't work, there's no good acronym there. But um, we're gonna use several um, specific tactics for actually addressing cultural problems. Um, I really want to disincentivize bad behavior because we've got bad um, actors in all aspects of science that are pushing people out, um, making expectations clear. Um, so helping people navigate open science and make, helping them navigate science in general by making uh, what we expect them clear, showing humanity, um, inviting people in and being kind. So we're gonna just talk a little bit more about those. So what I want more than anything in the world is for us to all stop romanticizing the brilliant jerk. Um, with apologies to Hugh Laurie, um, I'm sure he's a very nice man, but he is, he's the symbol of my brilliant jerk here. Um, so this um, is something that I've been thinking about ever since actually reading Kirsty Whitaker's um, Code of Conduct for her lab. And so in it, she writes something to the effect of, I don't care how much contribution you have made to my lab. If you are violating my code of conduct, we're gonna have a talk. And if you, if you don't improve your behavior after we talk, you're out. Because losing people due to jerks, it, being alienated by um, jerks who we've made excuses for is one of the ways that we are bleeding good people from science. Um, and I've been on the academic job market for a couple years, and let me tell you, there's a lot of brilliant people out there. We don't need to make time for jerks. We can, we can uh, replace you if you're going to be a jerk. And then setting clear expectations. And so this builds off of Kirsty's um, code of conduct for her lab. I, I, I decided to take it one step further, and I am codifying all of the expectations for all of the aspects of operations of my lab. Um, so we're, we're talking about guidelines for what I expect a project to look like when it's done. Guidelines for how we're going to plan out a graduate program in my lab. Um, we're, and then going back to the code of conduct, specific a, um, ways that um, I, I expect people to behave and specific ways I do not expect people to behave and exactly the procedures that we will be addressing if those codes are violated. And so I had to put it in the context of US law um, in um, our cases, um, because of course, there are, there are certain constraints that we have to operate under for legal standards as well. 
And so just creating this, this very clear expectation. Um, so hopefully people know not just how to behave, but also how to react when people around them don't behave. The, the next um, key feature, I believe, in a successful open science pro program is to fail publicly and often. So this is going directly against the idea of, you know, covering up science's lumps and bumps. Um, people are more likely to um, really um, feel welcome in a place where they, they don't feel like an outsider. And guess what? Newcomers, they're going to mess up a lot. And so if they can see the people, the established people who all um, in the community who are also messing up a lot, they, they will help um, have that barrier removed. They, they will essentially see that, you know what, we're not all experts at everything. And sometimes there are lab fires, hopefully not literal. <laughs> okay. And then... Now I looked, I, I went to allude to the famous supposedly African proverb that if you want to go um, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. But apparently there is no um, known origin of this saying. And so it's only vaguely alluded to in a variety of places, sort of through this mystical um, way in as an African proverb. So there is, <laughs> so we're just going to say it's a, a um, proverb that is commonly used in our culture that if you want to go far, um, go together. So if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I can't tell you how important it has been for me to find a community and to bring in like minded people to work with me to push. Um, both um, projects forward and to just help support me in my own work, in my own um, exploration of sciences. Um, and so this is um, the Mozilla Fellows, and you might um, recognize a, a person in that picture <laughs> who is in the room right now. Um, and so I, I build, building a community and inviting people into the community is absolutely essential. Now, I was invited into this community by Mozilla and um, people in the Mozilla Science Lab. And I can tell you that I would not be where I am today if I hadn't been invited in. Um, I would have probably just been in my silo, kind of um, spinning my wheels and, and being grumpy about um, how people don't work together well. And then finally, practicing kindness in science. Um, so this is um, a hashtag that was made popular by Tammy Steves. So you can um, look her up on uh, Twitter. Um, but um, this was tweeted under this hashtag. And so we just need to focus on making science kinder. Um, this is for open science and um, just science in general. We need to focus on thinking of the needs of the people that we're giving feedback to. We need to think about um, how we can bring people in and how we can really emphasize positive, the positive to bring um, our newcomers, especially into our, our world. And my hope is that these ideas go viral in open science. And so they have to a certain extent because um, it was a couple of weeks ago, one morning, I woke up um, and found um, my face on Twitter and I hadn't tweeted it. So something had happened. Uh, and I was actually featured um, by um, a seismologist named Christopher Jackson in the opening keynote. My, my Specifically, my lab code of conduct was featured in the opening keynote of Force 11 um, in Berlin. And, and so it's, that was pretty exciting that, you know, if you put these ideas out there, you can get people to join in and, and um, grab on to these ideas. Okay, and I think that that's it. And oh, wow, I'm exactly on time. So yay. <laughs> okay, so let me unshare the screen. There. Uh, and can you hear me? I can hear you. Amazing. Amazing. Um, <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a nice echo, which is a little bit strange. So I think I'm going to mute us. Okay. And I, no, that's not going to work because then you're not going to be able to. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to use the microphone. I'm just going to stand close to here. Uh, does anyone have any okay. questions? <laughs> <laughs> no arguments from you guys. 
It's not really a question, it's more a comment because I, I just found it very interesting of what you were just talking about there. A lot of what we're talking about and the issues we have discussed earlier today is about looking after ourselves as advocates and um, how we manage the deeply invested emotions that uh, researchers sometimes have against open access and also having to manage therefore sometimes online trolling and bullying and behaviour that, that we shouldn't have to be dealing with. Yeah, and there are, yeah I, Chrissy, I wish that you had been here for the focus groups because I think you would have loved all of the conversations that everyone was having. It was, you, you sort of articulated a lot of them into a talk in a really beautiful way. Um, yeah. Anyone have any questions for Chrissy? I, I'll, ask, I'll ask one. Um, who do you think is most likely to join your lab and who do you think is least likely to join your lab? Hmm. So that's, that is an interesting question. Um, so I, I've, um, so far I can actually tell you sort of hard data. Um, I have about seven or eight applicants right now um, for grad programs and um, well, um, one of them is a white male. So, <laughs> and so it's partially been me specifically going out and saying, hey, you're doing something interesting. Would you like to work in my lab? Could, can we put it together an application? Um, and it's partly just um, from my, my online presence. I, I think I create um, a little bit more of a welcoming environment. And so I am getting very specifically highly mathy women. So women with a lot of mathematical interest um, who feel um, like it would be a good place for them to be. And so um, that that is probably uh, where they deviate from average. Um, I probably will alienate some very traditionally um, taught scientists, I think. Um, I have in the past. So, <laughs> so I, I imagine they probably won't be applying to work in my lab. But um, I find that this message is um, fairly well received across a wide variety of people. Um, it just, you know, scientists are empirical enough that when you say, okay, if we look at the community we're trying to serve and we look at the community that we have in our, um, in our lab, in our department, in our organization, and the diversity is different, that means that there's a filter. It's not a random sample. Um, and so we, when you show them sort of like talk to them in sort of empirical terms of the uh, community ecologist, you can sort of say, oh, they sort of say, yeah, yeah, you're right. Huh, this is a non-random sample. What's what's going on here? We are applying filters. Last question. Um, Chrissy, you were talking about the fact that you with the whole brilliant jerk thing, I feel like part of the problem is that on TV, brilliant jerks are really obvious because a brilliant jerk is a brilliant jerk and he walks around being all jerky. But then <laughs> at the right moment, his brilliance comes to the floor and everyone's like, oh, you're great. But in real life, it feels so much more messy than that. You get mm -hmm. that you can't. You're like, is this person a jerk? I mean, I understand where they're coming from. and. You know, maybe this person is just really bad at communicating and mm -hmm. there's so many like layers and levels and shades of grey to the jerks and sometimes they're jerked by design and sometimes they're jerked by circumstance so you get people who are perfectly lovely but when paired with the wrong other people suddenly everyone's a jerk. Um, <laughs> how do you identify a jerk that is a jerk that you want to Eject. <laughs> <laughs> that is a that's a hard question, um, but I like it because I mean, yeah, just like science, um, humans are messy, and um, you know, I'm a jerk sometimes too. Um, so that that's that's a hard thing, and so I think that the 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 real um, jerk is the person who is consistently 
displaying problematic behavior, someone who has no desire to change their behavior. And so, or someone who reacts very poorly when their, their bad behavior is addressed. And so um, it, it's, a, it's more of a behavior pattern rather than a, an event. Um, and so th the reality is like th there, there is going to be messiness associated with every human interaction. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, there's no easy answer. There's um, no easy answer, but I think that it's when you have someone who is disruptive at a systematic level and just consistent level, that's when you, you have to address them and cast them out, essentially. And hopefully everyone else can bring in some various points in the I've forgotten the catch on the earlier points that I made. Uh, <laughs> we see the feedback in the sound is maybe not all that great, but can we give Christy like a huge stand up sort of wave a round of applause? Like, <laughs> Thank you for having me. All right, bye bye. All right. Yeah. I'm just going to mute my microphone because yeah. I would love to see the next speaker. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right.